In 73 BC, one of the most famous rebellions in history broke out. A slave revolt in ancient Rome led by the gladiator slave Spartacus would shake the Roman Republic to its core. Spartacus was a Thracian who was later captured, sold into slavery, and forced to fight as a gladiator in the Roman arenas. Not much is known about his life outside the rebellion or how he fell into slavery. However, his story has resonated with millions of people over the 2,000 years since his death. The Roman Republic was a complex machine that was driven by the labor of slaves captured in foreign conquests or through trade. Slavery in the Roman Republic was cruel, but gladiators were seen as the lowest of the low, similar to prostitutes and actors. Though many TV shows and movies have depicted Spartacus as a famed gladiator, there isn't much information regarding his career in the arena. Whatever it was, it was apparent by the year 73 BC he and his fellow gladiators had had enough of slavery. They launched a surprise escape plan, though it was initially foiled, but he and 70 others were able to fight their way to freedom using kitchen utensils and tools. Shortly after gaining freedom for themselves, Spartacus was selected as one of the slave revolt's leaders along with a few others named Crixus, Animaeus, Castus, and Gannicus. Spartacus set himself apart as the leader, however it is unclear whether he was the main leader or if that was just how the Romans viewed the revolt's hierarchy. The rebellion could not have come at a worse time for the Romans. The Republic did not have a professional army at this point in its history, and most of the veteran, battle-hardened legionnaires were far away engaged in foreign wars, such as the General Pompey Magnus, who was putting down another rebellion that had broken out in Spain. Spartacus and his forces were able to take advantage of the absence of the experienced soldiers. In the beginning stages of what would become known as a Third Servile War, Rome saw the slave revolt as a minor policing matter, or something that could be dealt with locally. After all, it was only a few slaves that were poorly armored and had few resources. They sent a force led by a man named Claudius Glaber who trapped the rebels on the cliffs of Mount Vesuvius. Instead of attacking and ending the rebellion as it stood, Glaber decided it would be better to seal off the one passage down the mountain and starve the rebels out. This simple strategy should have been more than enough, however, Glaber did what the Romans would continue to do for the next two years, which is underestimate the ingenuity and resolve of Spartacus and his men. Refusing to go out by starvation, Spartacus ordered his men to take vines and braid them together to create ropes long enough to reach the ground below. He and his men climbed down behind the Roman lines and slaughtered them before they knew what was happening. The Romans sent another force soon after, which was also crushed. With news of these victories, many slaves flocked to Spartacus and his army, which grew from 70 to 70,000. Since not much is known about Spartacus' history before becoming a slave, it is unclear how he knew so much about Roman military tactics and how he was able to use them against the Romans. Some speculate he may have at one point served as a mercenary for the Romans, however, there is no definitive proof either way. Whatever the case may be, Spartacus always seemed to be a step ahead of the Romans and even seemed to be able to use things like the terrain, climate, and anything else he could to his advantage. In the year 72 BC, the Roman Senate was in a full-blown panic. They could not believe that the great Roman army was being bested by mere slaves. As things began to fall apart for the Romans, it was also starting to unravel for Spartacus. His co-leader Crixus had a different vision for the future of the rebels. Those that followed his leadership preferred to stay in Italy and plunder, whereas Spartacus sought to escape over the Alps to freedom. The conflict between the two leaders came to a head when Crixus and his followers decided to slaughter Roman prisoners as retribution for their previous enslavement, though Spartacus tried to stop it. Eventually, Crixus and 30,000 slaves split apart from Spartacus and the main force. They were attacked by a Roman consular legion led by Lucius Gellius Publicola and were massacred. Crixus was killed in battle along with nearly all of his forces. When word reached Spartacus, he was devastated and ordered 300 Roman prisoners to fight to the death as gladiators to honor Crixus. At this point, the history is subjective and conflicting reports appear. However, most prominent sources indicate that Spartacus, whose army was now over 100,000 strong, defeated the consular legions as they headed north towards the Alps. As they headed north, Spartacus, for reasons unknown, even to the Roman historians from the time period, decided to turn his army back south. The Roman Senate, not knowing what else to do, made the decision to appoint Marcus Licinius Crassus, the richest man in Rome and arguably one of the richest in history, to put an end to the rebellion once and for all. Crassus had a reputation for being ruthless. It is said that he gained his wealth through shady means like intentionally burning down sections of Rome and then buying the land for dirt cheap and selling it at a high price. He was also harsh on his men. 
After one of his commanders, Mumius, was defeated by Spartacus, Crassus had his men punished by decimation. Decimation was an extremely brutal form of execution in which every ten soldier was beaten to death by the other nine. It is unclear whether he applied this punishment to his entire army or just the ones who survived the lost battle. In any case, Crassus' goal was to ensure his men feared him more than the enemy. After this, the Romans won a series of battles against Spartacus and the tide began to turn. Spartacus, now in need of reinforcements and supplies, made a deal with pirates to ferry him and a few thousand of his troops to Sicily, where he intended to start an uprising there and gain the resources he would need to continue the war. Unfortunately, the pirates took the money and abandoned Spartacus and his army in southern Italy. About the same time, Pompey Magnus returned to Rome, having put down the rebellion in Spain. Since Crassus knew Pompey was already famous and well-loved by the Roman Senate and people, he foresaw the Senate sending Pompey to put an end to the rebellion. Not wanting to share the glory, Crassus became desperate to crush the rebellion on his own. Spartacus attempted to offer peace terms to Crassus, but was rejected because Crassus believed that a slave could not be bargained with because that would imply that the Romans viewed the slaves as free and equal. Spartacus then returned to his camp and had a Roman prisoner crucified in front of his army to remind them of what would happen to them if they lost the final battle. Despite the fact that Spartacus had led his people successfully against impossible odds before, his forces panicked. Small groups began to break off and were slaughtered by the Romans. Spartacus had no choice but to eventually turn his entire force around in one massive block and fight the Romans head on. The final battle, the Battle of the Silas River, was absolute carnage. Tens of thousands of rebels and Romans were massacred in the Roman victory. About 6,000 rebels survived, but Crassus had them crucified along the Via Appia as a warning to any other slave who even dreamed of rebelling in the future. Another 5,000 slaves attempted to escape to the north, but Pompey, now involved, caught them and had them killed. Spartacus himself was said to have died in the battle, but his body was never found. Upon returning to Rome, Pompey declared that he, not Crassus, was the true hero, as it was Pompey who had put down the rebels in Spain, while Crassus had only beaten a few slaves. The Senate agreed, and Pompey was awarded a triumph, the highest honor a Roman could receive, whereas Crassus only received a small commendation. Despite being rivals, Crassus and Pompey would soon become allies and join together with Julius Caesar to form the First Triumvirate, which would change the Roman Republic and pave the way for the Roman Empire. Things did not end well for Crassus and Pompey. Eventually, Crassus thought he could take on the Parthian Empire and found out very quickly that fighting an empire was much different than a slave army. Crassus was killed in a skirmish and stories emerged that the Parthians poured molten gold down his throat to mock his thirst for wealth. Pompey, after losing a decisive battle against Caesar after their fallout, fled to Egypt where he was executed on the orders of Ptolemy XIII's advisor and his body was thrown into the sea. Spartacus vs. Crassus is a tale of power versus influence. For all intents and purposes, Spartacus had no power. He started from absolutely nothing to gaining the support of hundreds of thousands of people who risked their lives to follow him. Crassus had power but very little influence. His power came from his wealth, but he was really only tolerated because he could afford to pay for his own military support. Once he defeated Spartacus in battle, he was quickly pushed aside by the Roman Senate. Only through his alliance with Caesar and Pompey did he stay relevant, yet the two others quickly surpassed him. Think about most leaders today. Many leaders in an organization wield power, but very few have influence, and oftentimes their power is confused as influence. Crassus did not respect his subordinates. When they failed, he punished them, brutally. Spartacus was well-loved because he shared the spoils of war. He rewarded his followers for a job well done. When Crassus was finally victorious, he sought fanfare for himself. A triumph was a celebration of a person, and while the army had a part in it, it was really about honoring an individual. One of the most prominent things employees say they hate about their job is that their supervisor or the organization's leadership doesn't value their hard work. We've all seen those managers who take credit for work they didn't do, or fail to recognize people who help make things a success. A good leader understands that without a strong front line and behind the scenes staff, they have nothing. If you're a manager, has there been a time when you've treated your employees as expendable resources? I know at times in my career I have. I've been driven by praise and accolades and lost sight of what is important. Not surprisingly, I also failed at my job during those times. Crassus never learned that important lesson. People who sacrifice others for their own personal game may seem successful in the short term, but they never truly get what they want. Crassus wanted power and glory, and when he defeated Spartacus, he got a small taste of each. However, he is basically all but forgotten by history. Ironically, the only reason he is even really remembered is because of Spartacus. 
Think about a time if and when you put your own ambitions in front of your staff. Did it turn out well? What did it cost you? There are three lessons that any leader can take away from Spartacus and Crassus. Number one, no common mission equals no unity. If people outside the organization can't tell what your mission is, there's a good chance the people in the organization don't know what it is either. Even Roman historians who documented the Third Servile War were unclear as to the motives or goals of the rebel army. One would expect gaining freedom to be the main goal for the rebels, but when they had the chance to escape, they turned around and headed back into Italy. It wasn't to destroy Rome, as the rebels never even made an attempt to attack it even when they had a force of 120,000. There is nothing in the historical record to indicate that they wished to reform Roman society or end slavery as an institution either. There was nothing that unified the slaves other than being freed from bondage. They came from all over the Republic and by extension all over the world. There was no shared language or culture. The rebellion was held together by nothing more than people not wanting to be slaves anymore. Just because you have a group of people that are supposedly united in a common purpose doesn't mean you should assume that they want the same things. Had Spartacus and Crixus understood each other's motivations even a little bit, who knows what they could have accomplished. Despite the fact that their lives were on the line, the rebel leaders still couldn't come to a consensus. This caused confusion and chaos within the rebellion causing a breakdown in discipline. If people couldn't come to a consensus when their lives were on the line, think about how much more difficult it is to find a common purpose when the stakes are much lower. As a leader, try to understand the motivations of each of your team members. Is there a way to channel their individual motivations into a common purpose? Number two, never underestimate the competition. Just as the Romans had originally underestimated the slave army, the rebels also underestimated the Romans. Rome didn't survive for 600 years before this for no reason. Prior to this, they had destroyed empires and put down two other slave revolts despite facing destruction themselves. Roman culture was the epitome of resolve. Due to his military prowess, Spartacus must have known he was not fighting against the main Roman army. Yet, victories against the undisciplined Romans they faced may have made the other rebel leaders overconfident. Organizations that stay successful are always looking for new ways to stay ahead of the curve. They never take their success for granted because they know the moment they do, they become irrelevant. Think of the way many industries have changed in the last few years. Things that were once popular and seemed like they would be around forever are now forgotten. Remember CDs? Or researching things for school in an actual book? Online degrees used to be considered a joke and now the most prestigious schools offer virtual learning. If you overestimate your own relevance and underestimate the abilities of your competition, you will go the same route as the rebellion or Betamax. Number three, leadership means sacrifice. I'm not sure that if I were in Spartacus shoes, I would have stayed loyal to my men. When escape was guaranteed, but his followers decided to stay in Italy, he stayed with them as their leader. He could have easily said, well, I got you this far and now I'm out and left, but he didn't. How much are you willing to sacrifice for your employees? As Spartacus knew, leadership is not about directing, but sacrificing. When things get difficult, how will you respond? We're all driven by self-preservation, and when the ship begins to sink, we all want a place in the lifeboat. There's nothing wrong with that. But perception is reality, and for many employees, they need to know that their supervisor has their back and is willing to go out on a limb for them when it's needed. Using lip service will quickly backfire, and you will lose the respect of your team. Eventually, there may come a point when you need to rely on your team for support, and if you have laid the foundation of trust and support, your team will go to bat for you when you need it too. Crassus is barely remembered in history, and what he is remembered for is his lust for wealth and power. However, Spartacus has become a legend. Even in ancient Rome, he becomes a sort of boogeyman in the night to scare children. 2,000 years later, he still inspires because of what he accomplished through loyalty and sacrifice. What type of leader do you want to be? Millions may not remember you, but the people you work with will. How do you want them to remember you? When you influence people in a positive way, they will remember how you inspired them and they will want to inspire others as well. When you lead, you have a choice. When someone tells their story, will you be the hero like Spartacus or a footnote like Crassus?